Are we live is the question. I believe we are. Hello, hello, yeah. Mr. Hope Win. Hello, Mr. Bell. How are we doing, sir? Yeah, good. Still here. Still here du- during uh, strange times. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought, I thought, you know, given we can't leave our house, I'll, I'll bring you to the world through the powers of, uh, through the powers of, uh, of uh, YouTube and the Aurora website. Well, that's mighty kind of you. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for being here with us. Um, so I suppose really the point of me kind of doing these videos is just to kind of give the the outer world and our audiences a little bit of a, an insight into kind of who the team are um, here at Aurora, who the who the kind of teams are outside of that, things that we're up to, um, and I suppose going into a little bit of what we've got planned uh, moving forward. Um, so I suppose... I suppose it would make sense to kind of almost start of a little bit of a of an introduction, kind of like you know how on earth what we we've been we've been friends now for what five years, something like that. Yes, yes, uh, very cool. I believe it's been around five years. This is Stephen Hope Wim, by the way. This is the the founder and the uh, the composer and the amazing songwriter for uh, for Skyquaker. Um, I, I suppose... am indeed Stephen Hope Wim. I can certify that. <laughs> we go, yeah. I'll have to get the official stamp, sir. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I suppose it, it would have been a good idea to introduce you first before before Yakin. But hey, this this is how we this is how we do <laughs> things. Um, I believe you came into. I was working for a, for an an Apple um, shop, wasn't I? I was in an Apple store as a tech support guy, and uh, yeah. I remember uh, some guy came kind of like coming out the back, going, "There's this there's this mad bloke at the desk. I don't know what he's talking about. He's going on about Pro Tools. It's, it sounds like something that's in your field, Mike." And then I kind of I think we spent about three hours in the store and sort of ended up in the pub, didn't we? Yeah, I, I, I recall that to be exactly the case. Yeah, I had uh, I was in the middle of writing and recording stuff on Pro Tools, not just uh, music, but also um, voice acting stuff because I am a voiceover as well. I do a lot of that. And uh, I had some stuff I needed to deliver. And Pro Tools, for some reason, decided not to work anymore. And I think it was linking files into sessions. So I, I, and I thought it was an Apple problem. And so I came to the shop, and that's that's the story. That's yeah, that's that's there. And then yeah, we we, we I suppose we we exchanged numbers and sort of decided to go for a beer. Started talking everything music and film and and uh, and everything like that. I mean, can you let us know? Um, I suppose a little a little about yourself, Steve. Your, your story, kind of. How long have you been playing music? Ah, right. Okay. First <laughs> of all, I should say that Michael W. Bell was very helpful in resolving my issues. And uh, I had to replenish his uh, beer tokens <laughs> and in accordance with his kind help. So to your second question, um, I've been playing music since I was a child. I grew up in a classical music family. Um, my father had uh, uh, run away from home at the age of 14 and joined the, the army. Uh, he lived in uh, a tenement in Edinburgh and he became a boy soldier and a bandsman. So he he learned the bassoon. So I grew up um, with a lot of bassoon playing around me. My mother, who similarly came from a very modest background, she was a, um, grew up in a coal mining community called Newburn, uh, near the Head and on the Wall in Newcastle on Tyne. Okay. And she escaped that area by being a singer. And she eventually got, I think, a scholarship to go to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. So as a consequence of that, I grew up amid parents who were constantly immersed in and outputting uh, extraordinary high levels of of, um, classical music. Uh, my father was always working in orchestras, if not teaching, as well as running a business, because he was a, when he left the army, he was an engineer and an inventor. Um, so, and my mother was always off singing uh, in operas, and often they were in the same shows together. So I grew up in a lot of orchestra pits, <laughs> sleeping on the timpani covers and the harp covers. Amazing. So I, I suppose I was constantly exposed to music amazing I th- well I, th- I think that's it goes to say doesn't it is uh, you know i think if, if you are exposed to kind of even just looking at because really they're bits of instruments are bits of technology aren't they i think people sometimes don't see them as that but they are you know so it's almost like by you sort of sleeping under timpani and sort of like moving around looking at cellos i suppose it just becomes sort of part of your dna doesn't it yeah i remember being very intimately attached to um the harp 
and the double bass sections. So it's that, that those frequencies around you, uh, as a small child, it, it just permeates through your entire body. Um, the bizarre thing is I'm not a very proficient player. I uh, never have been, but I, but, but in, so it's what's inside my head and my imagination is, I suppose, what, what I have um, absorbed. Well, I suppose it's just an interesting thing you'd say, though, because if you because really I do class you as as I know you've you kind of you put songwriter out there, but you are a composer, really, um, in the sense that you can hear um, a bit like me where, you know, I can't play all these orchestral instruments, you know, um, but you kind of you know, the nuance and the and the kind of the. The, the the quality of the timbre of that specific instrument. So you know when we're talking about putting a track to window, when we were producing Queen Kong, for instance, you know, and you said, Mike, I think we could really do with you know with can we put some piano in there and can we put you know you really kind of got into that that sort of arrangement sort of composer element. And I, I find sometimes when talking to you, is it's almost um, you might not necessarily know I- exactly what instrument or quality you want to bring to a Skyquaker track. But you, through the through the conversation we have and kind of talking about instruments, we, we kind of get there if if that makes sense. And I feel like mm. that's you know if you mm. look at all composers, none of, none of them were okay. They might have been pro, um, uh, proficient at the piano or the violin, say in, in, in Vivaldi's case, for instance, or, or something along those lines. But I do feel that that, that having that kind of um, that knowledge of instrumentation and that knowledge of observing and, and kind of channeling into players. It is really like it's almost like a key to a composer's uh, toolkit, and I do feel that you that you maybe through the what you've just said with with your upbringing, maybe that was something that was that was formed then. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I was particularly exposed to lyrical opera, so when I think of an instrument, I don't think of what what sound would work here. It's more about what what lyrical shaping would work in a given part, and for instance a double bass or a cello might have a much bigger sweep or an arc of expression than, say, uh, a cor anglais or, or a piece, a, a woodwind voice. Sure. But some might say, well, actually, a woodwind voice is more appropriate sound in that context. But I think of the actual shaping, how its voice turns and carves the arc. It's they... sometimes where what I, I suppose, distracts me. Well, uh, well, I think because we, I mean, we've we've spoken about. I mean, I suppose on the philosophical aspect, me and you have spoken a lot. We've spoken heavily, really, about textures and 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 building kind of big palettes of sound. And again, I think that maybe you know, just talking to you now, I think I maybe can see how that's maybe come about from from you. You know, observing music and, and, and observing different. You know, if you're if you're down in the pits and you're kind of like, where's that sound coming from? I wonder what that instrument is. You perhaps as a child you couldn't see it, but you're imagining it. You know, I don't know, but I find it always very interesting how people kind of get so attached to sounds. I mean, we were talking a lot about perspective, weren't we? And like that crazy um, binaural recording I somehow found the other day. You know, oh, I know. You, yeah, that was astonishing. Yeah, I know you're very kind of um, um, aware of space of sounds. Well, um, I was at some point in my childhood profoundly deaf for a period, and to some ex- extent, I had to rebuild my understanding of, of speech, um, and that meant a lot of listening. I can't quite remember when that was, but I had a um, an infection in my eustachian tubes, uh, which caused deafness, which was undetected for a while, um, and it was only when I was having flu or colds that, that I would be able to hear my heart rate through my through louder than I could hear other people speaking. Right. And so I suppose um, I cultivated a, a, a different range of, of listening uh, um, attention. No, I think that makes sense. Yeah. I think it does make sense. But I think all these things, Steve, really, have, and, and I suppose we, we can't really interview Steve Hope Wynn without taking a slight detraction away from music, um, you know, because... Really, you know, your whole life has been, you know, your, your experience is, is quite is, is quite impressive, Steve. And, and um, I think, our, you know, our our, uh, <laughs> our audience may be interested to hear, you know, uh, I mean, obviously trying not to kind of me and you could talk all day, you know, did, yeah, could, could, you give a, could you give us a kind of like a, a little bit of obviously you started with music and with your family and then you kind of played around with different instruments. Um, what then you got into acting? I mean, how did how did that come about? Well, my mother was an actress, um, as, a, as well as a singer. So inevitably, 
I got involved in the theatre shows that she was in or directing. Um, to sort of start the answer to your question uh, briefly, I started learning the piano at around about age four, okay. five. Uh, formal training from about six onwards. I did a, a few grades, but I wasn't particularly proficient, as I, as I said. Then I went on to have a go at the violin, and that was quite, I learned to play that quite well up to a point, but I found that very difficult physically. Um, and then eventually, at around about the age of 10 or 11, I moved on to the French horn. Um, my parents wanted me to be a chorister. I refused, like a fool that I am. <laughs> and uh, but, but I enjoyed playing the French horn because that took me into completely different interactions with my father. My father, as well as being a philharmonic orchestral player, he was also played in a military band. So he and I would go together from about the age when I was about 11 or 12, and I would play the French horn with him at, in this marching band that also used to cover a lot of uh, very expressive classics and jazz. Okay. And that's when I started to really want to understand jazz. Incredible. I mean, I, th I think, and the thing I like as well, because I've actually mixed a fair, a fair few of your of your French your French horn lines, and um, you know what what is <laughs> <it's, it's, laughs> they're, they're amazing. It's it's um and, and and obviously maybe slightly moving forward, but into the Skyquake, um, which is an intro track where me and Steve are currently collaborating on. There's some amazing stuff in there from the horn, from again from a textural point of view. So. I suppose that well, a it's amazing to hear about a father and his son playing music. That that that's one thing that, that I kind of wish I always had because for me, I'm really I'm the only musical person in my family. Um, so that that is quite incredible to hear, kind of you know getting into into jazz. And I suppose look, I mean, I could be wrong here, but looking at military band, sure they they would have played classics, but I would imagine, as you as you've said, that the jazz it, it probably was something that was sort of experimented with and, and touched upon within those groups. Well, yeah, there was a subdivision of the marching band. There was um, what's called the concert band, and they played very much more dance tunes, which were jazz tunes. So uh, we played a lot of Glenn Miller okay. um, and stuff like that, um, and it's sort of entertainment, big big band stuff, and that was great. I had been going through the punk thing at the same time as this, and I'd been working with the Sex Pistols, well, Steve Jones and Paul Cook, formerly of the Sex Pistols, and Sham 69, and various others. So... Um, my parents were very unhappy with me having anything to do with rock music. In fact, there were only a few limited uh, vinyl records in, in the house that weren't classical. Uh, there were probably about a dozen pop music records. I was allowed the rationing of watching um, The Monkees on a Saturday evening in or around Doctor Who. Um, and I think that some of the records were like Smokey Robinson's Tears of a Clown, a couple of Beatles records, uh, uh, um, High Hopes by Frank Sinatra and a few things like that sure. and um, yeah. Downtown by Petula Clark that was it, which was a great great yeah. record um, but I remember really when I when travelling I, I collected radios and I used to take radios apart and rebuild them and I used to listen to a lot of shortwave and longwave um, European stations and I was always listening to French jazz or flamenco was it was that well, almost like on ham radio type 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 things? Well, they might. I don't think that. I think there were state state run stations. Okay. But there was always a plethora of really unusual um, uh, French jazz. Sure. You know, really obscure musicians uh, that it just was totally off mainstream. And I found that the European stations were so much more experimental and explorative for different for independent artists. So I was absolutely overwhelmed by French jazz and um, flamenco, Spanish flamenco. I loved it. It okay. meant so much to me. I suppose that maybe those maybe those stations as well. I suppose you could you could say maybe that was the start of this real sort of fusion um of genres in in some ways or maybe fuse, fusing styles from perhaps you know obviously classical players kind of coming together and, and making sort of you know something completely new um which yeah i think i i mean it's just, it's just this down isn't it now you know all of us have got youtube or or uh, spotify or something like that you've got access to like everything you know and and there's you kind of trying to get like a, a medium to long wave channel or or you know your, your kind of weekly dose um, of of sort of from the television kind of thing, you know, I can imagine in a way it's it, it's quite compounding in the way that I want to get this music, I want to hear more of this kind of thing, um, and it's again it starts to form you, I suppose it starts to um, 
you know, you, you, you almost carve a bit of a, a bit of a musical personality, I suppose, from that. I think, without a doubt, it, 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 if you if you sit from many streams, you, you're gonna it's gonna get into your blood somehow, without a doubt. Um, and it was a great privilege, I suppose. I, what I don't realise now, and, and only just in thinking about it as you're asking these questions, is that it's amazing that we as human beings have had so much so much exposure to so many different sources of music, and yet that before the big broadcasters have taken it all all into their pre-chosen collective, which is actually very narrow. Absolutely. I think, when we think Absolutely. Which I think really is, I mean, I kind of was in the heavy, I was in the heavy metal kind of genre growing up and then I kind of got fed up with the, the narrow mindedness of it, you know, and I, mm. I think mm. me coming to film was a way of me kind of getting away from that and Hey, I can do what the hell I want because you know, who knows what the film's going to want. And I think, yeah. we're, you know, for me, with Skyquaker, you know, all these things you're kind of saying, they're pointing me towards Skyquaker. You know, if we look at, if we look at those kind of, um, those dots in your life, if you like, of picking up bits and bobs of different, of different uh, music and different fusion, and then Skyquaker kind of being almost a, a fusion act. I think that's, I, I, it, it, I find that quite interesting to see, to see, you know, Skyquaker is almost like the, you know the, the the culmination of your musical experience in many ways, where you're bringing in lots of different things and constantly trying to kind of merge as much as you possibly can within a collective. Yeah, I, I guess you're right, Michael. Um, I think how can I put it? Skyquaker it was actually stimulated by some reading I did on the Chinese music market. Um, just to, to cap it quickly, is in China uh, music from the outside world has only really been available to, to the Chinese audiences for say about 10 or 20 years maximum. And in that time, they'd had all of the copious different genres of music, popular music, whatever, however many strands you want to describe, they'd had it in a very short space of time, whereas we've had popular music in over 50, 60, 70 years. And so in the West or the rest of the world, if you like, we've formulated our trend genre attachments I wear these clothes because I like listening to goth type music, etc., and so on and so forth. In China, they don't have that. It's like they'll be they'll be line dancing at lunchtime and then uh, attending a punk gig at night and then going to see ABBA, an ABBA sort of sounding type group or a pop, girly pop group the next day. And I think that that to me proposed uh, a much broader and more captive audience that wants to just listen to anything. I suppose, I suppose it's, it's interesting you say that because because maybe like like you say in the West where it was almost like different groups were emerging at different times and there were kind of movements which fed and influenced another movement. I suppose taking what we've said about maybe the modern way of consuming music, I suppose from a Chinese perspective, they've just been given it all. So they haven't maybe gone through, I suppose, those cultural changes in terms of music. Um, and obviously society is very different out there, as, as we know. But I, I wonder whether that is a part of it that, that you know, because they've kind of, because they've the West is almost kind of opening up in terms of music and it's becoming like a mainstream kind of thing to kind of, let's go and listen to, to what I suppose what they could call world music, really. Um, but they haven't gone through all the all the bollocks, I suppose you could say, all the kind of, well, I'm not talking to you because you're a metalhead and I'm not talking to you because you're a <laughs> punk and... You know, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like um, all those kind of group identities that, you went, that we went through in the West. Yeah, um, yeah, pretty much. They don't have, I don't think they've got that clutter. I, I should point out that up until a while ago, and it may still be the case that if you were a punk, you could be arrested. It was a serious offence. Um, punk clubs or punk gigs were very much uh, antisocial and against the law. Um, whether that's changed or not, I don't know. But yeah, I, it, it's the forbidden fruit, isn't it? I guess. I guess it depends what their lyrical content is, but yeah, we won't get into that. But um, but yeah, I, I suppose it. I suppose it's kind of. I mean, talking about China, because really, as well, like you know, Aurora was always a very. I was always very focused on the West, and while I kind of had sort of Chinese instruments in my libraries, and I had kind of the the capability, I suppose, to nuance the sounds. Yeah. I hadn't really until until whatever conversation it was that we had. I kind of thought, hang about, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm neglecting almost an entire group of people and an entire like place on the globe that could be experiencing this music. And obviously, we went through um, 
uh, some steps, didn't we, Steve, um, to get a, a Queen Kong release, which which we did. Um, and I, I think it's kind of, um, you know, Aurora now being on what, 90, I think it's 96% of the globe, uh, the releases are available there. So that's, I think that's feeding into kind of, like you said, you you were, you were looking at, at, at kind of what was happening in China in terms of in terms of music, but I think it's kind of I think it's 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 it, it very much sits into again what Skyquaker are looking to do, and I know that video games were very much kind of on your on your um on your remit as well in terms of in terms of I suppose people into video games are quite I mean music music in games is 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 quite incredible you know I didn't I I'm slightly too young to have played the kind of early um uh, games I suppose I played them to a to a point but here in some of these um some of the scores that were on the games they're just incredible with with such limited technology and very limited channels i feel like yeah. they, they were i mean this is maybe coming from a more of a japanese standpoint but the way that they were the way they were creating taking western music and putting them into games i think gamers have been used to listening to kind of heavy metal to new age to to you know to to, to you know and different characters in street fighter for instance might come out and they might have an asian theme or they never western mm-hmm. theme i think they're quite used to kind of that fusion of different styles, the video gaming audience in general, they're used to listening to soundscapes. They're, they're mm. used to kind of almost um, like palette based music that can just come from anywhere. I think it's, it kind of comes as part and parcel of the genre. Yeah, I guess I, I think anything that's visual <laughs> and lends itself to a visual experience is um, carrying a bit more punch, uh, you know, uh, than, it, than just a sonic intent intention. <laughs> And this is why we love you, Steve. That is absolutely how I feel about about uh, music, and you know, obviously being very cinematic. And I, I know you are very cinematic and very visual as well. So that that's a very uh, that that you know that that's definitely part of our working relationship, which I enjoy very much, mate. Same here, Michael. <laughs> um, so Skyquaker, I suppose we, we've 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 touched on it. I mean, how would you say was it about two thousand and eight that you you finally started coining the name? Uh, no, I was aware of what sky quakes are. Sky quakes are a, a, a physical phenomenon that happens on the planet, and they've been recorded for centuries. And um, they can be an ionospheric or a, geo, a geospheric um, activity. I don't know what, but they're described as cracks or booms or groaning sounds or horn sounds that the Earth emits. Uh, maybe it's to do with seismic stuff, I don't know. But... Um, People have made videos of them, some real, some not so. But I thought that that was um, an interesting name, the the Earth itself making sounds. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I think I think um, from all the conversations that we've had, and from from sort of opening up some of the sessions the Skyquaker have done, and and you know we're starting to hear some of these sounds almost being branded mm. within within Skyquaker, and I, I think it's really exciting and and. Um, I think as a as a concept, you know, because everything, you know, we've spoken a lot about sounds and and, and timbres in this in this chat, and, but I think it's, yeah. you know, I'd do it if I'm if I went for a walk earlier, you know, um, there was no planes in the sky, but you know, normally if there's a if there's a plane going over you, you know, it has a pitch, doesn't it? It has a, everything mm-hmm. has a sound um, in the world, everything, and and you know, it's like some people find air conditioning units sort of frustrating. I try and sample them. Yes, I sang along <laughs> to. Um, I sang along to a DFDS Berry uh, chimney vent, which I think was in <laughs> P minor. <laughs> oh, brilliant! We start. We use that as a, I think there's a whole concept right there. We use it. Yeah, we use it. Maybe we'll call the song the name of some industrial vent, and we use that as the drone. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows where it's going to go? I love it. I love it. I love I, it. I um, had a wonderful uh, call, a uh, phone call last night from out of the blue by a wonderful musician called Brian Gullen. Okay. Uh, Brian Gulland, uh, he knew my dad. In fact, he had played uh, in an orchestra with my father at Guildford Cathedral back in the late 70s, I think. Brian Gulland formed a band called, uh, just gone out of my mind, Griffin. Griffin, that was it. And they, they, they carried all sorts of different sounds. But he reminded me of uh, different machines and things he used to listen to that had resonant frequencies than... He'd get his bassoon out or whatever it was he was playing at the time and wind, wind the tune around it. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. I love it. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, it, was, it was kind of like, oh, I can't remember the name of the band. You know, it's that guy who used to play the flute and with his one, one 
uh, the name came to me, just went. You know that 1970s long haired band that uh, the, the, uh, the guy was a flautist? Oh, it's gone. A 1970s long haired band. Um, Why do I keep thinking Ray Cooder? It's not Ray Cooder. <laughs> Brilliant. Anyway. Well, I, know, I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly. I know exactly where, you, where, you, where you're coming from with it. Jethro Tull. Jethro, it. there he is. Jeff, he's found it. He's found yeah. it. And, and within the Griff, interview, well done. Griffin out. Jethro Tull's Jethro Tull. Love <laughs> it. Like. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, but yeah, he's he's hopefully Brian's going to be playing some bassoon on on uh, on some Skyquaker tracks soon. Actually. Incredible. We try, to, we try to get a hold of him to do um, baritone sax on Queen Kong, uh, but we. We didn't connect, and we ended up going for Tilly York, who was fantastic. Tilly York um, is a brilliant saxophonist, so she she brought a lot of. In fact, she's been our sax go-to lady for the last few tracks. I would say I'd have to second that. I mean, you know, kind of last night once I shut down from work, I'm doing my normal kind of putting some stuff on Instagram, and she's currently actually taking requests on yeah. uh, on Instagram for kind of live saxophone performances where she will learn a song. You know, and then broadcast it out, and it's just incredible. It, it, I think it's. Uh, I will give Tilly a, a big shout. I mean, hopefully she might come on on the chat. We'll see, but um, be because I think I, I think Tilly. I mean, if anyone ever says to me I need a saxophonist, I mean, it, her name's just straight there, isn't it? Tilly York, yeah. Tilly York, absolutely. She's, she's she's very young, and you know, she's she's doing lots of learning and building and growing. But she's 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 inventive and very competitive with her ideas when she when she jumps in. I agree, and I think as well because I mean I remember as well coming coming back to Queen Kong's uh, Skyquaker's mm-hmm. first uh, debut single. You know, I think I think it was about quarter to twelve or something at night, and and Steve, I get this sort of text message from Steve. You know, I'm sort of halfway through the mix at this point, and he, he's like, um, "I think I'm going to add a saxophone uh, to the track," and I'm thinking. <laughs> What do you mean you're gonna like? I was. I, I thought what? I thought I'll find him tomorrow. He must be pissed. You know, like, I thought what's <laughs> going on? You know. And then he explained it to me, and I thought, okay, I could see that working, and it, it really did become. Um, I mean, really, if you t- if you if you mute those sax lines, uh, there's so much energy and um, from that track just disappears. It really kind of it really. Um, you know, emphasizes the energy in the track. Uh, it's incredible, and the solos and everything. So, th- again, that was another th- that whole kind of challenging each other to kind of like bring other elements in. You know, I-, I wouldn't have thought let's put a saxophone in what really was quite a kind of like rock based punk element track. You know, um, we're throwing sax in. I mean, okay, you've got Scar and whatever else. I know that that, that, that the brass was there, but yeah, it's it, it, just incredible. And obviously, um, I suppose that leads us on nicely, if you'd like to say a few words about the upcoming release, um, which features Tilly yet again. And, and uh, it, a lot of the excitement in, in, in what you guys are about to hear um, in, what, 12 days? Um, Tilly's yeah. there again, as long with everybody else. So, uh, yeah, did you want to say a few words about, about the upcoming release? Yeah, um, thank God for rock and roll. Uh, was a, it's not one of my 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 older tunes. It's very it's a very recent uh, writing, uh, which I think came out of my brain whilst I was slightly elated driving back from my friend's brewery, Dorking Brewery, where I I drunk some of his beer, probably uh, just about just a half a pint of beer, <laughs> and it got straight to my head whilst I was driving. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> So I, I was I just thought of the title Thank God for Rock and Roll, you know, because I think the weather had been a bit rubbish or something. We heard some bad news going on around the world. So said, and so yes, the song Thank God for Rock and Roll, it's a story uh about a boy or a girl um who uh goes off the beaten path and makes mistakes and then finds their way back into life again through music whether Incredible. it's rap or jazz or punk or reggae, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's it's all rock and roll. And uh, at the same time, it's a kind of a homage to other people who have found inspiration and have given inspiration to others and perhaps have left this community before their time. Well, uh, yeah, it's, I, think it's an, I think it's an incredible concept. And I think you know, the, the conversations that we had as well is given the current situation that we're in, um, uh, you know, um, I think a lot of people are coming to music and, and you're seeing, you know, a lot more. And it, it kind of is, it is the Tillies of the world who are kind of like putting out, you know, like some live music on Instagram or, or yeah. um, you know, 
I suppose me and you to a point trying to bring people to Skyquaker through doing these chats and trying to bring people together and trying to keep that that music based community. You know, mu- music to me has always been like um, is a very universal thing to me. Uh, music, I think every every single person on the globe will will appreciate music in whichever way, shape, form it comes, as you've said, Steve. So. Yeah, okay. We're we're framing it in a uh, you know in a in, in a thank God for rock and roll kind of in a rock and roll context because I suppose that's something that's that's close to our hearts. But it's I think it's a uh, I think it it's a, I think it's a lovely track. It's it's a real uh, kind of upbeat track. I mean, I've been mastering it yesterday, and I keep singing it. You know, <laughs> I, I, keep, right. I just I just keep singing it. It's just it's just stuck in my head. Um, and uh, you know, I hope other people will will, will you know will, they're all in, if we can get you know. A thousand people in their in their homes, sort of, you know. I oh, thank God, you know. I, I'll be, uh, yeah. That that would be put a nice smile, I think, on all of our faces, you know. Very much so. Yeah, very much so. Tilly uh, does a great great piece of work of that. Tilly came to the put bricks in the wall where there were holes uh, in terms of punctuation, but 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 but, and that those kind of offbeats and syncopations are what it's kind of like a some punching you in between. Uh, yeah. The words as you're speaking, it sort of punctuates. Here we go, mate. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, it sort of just adds running power to the to the narrative. Absolutely. And, and I think that's narrative is is the power word. Uh, I guess that there's an act one, two, and three in every one of my songs. I hope, or I, you know, I don't always strive to do that, but it usually turns out that way. Um, and I think that a song is an opportunity to tell a story and to communicate a discovery or a re- not so much a revelation, but a discovery. And um, Tilly provides that energy. And she also adds a lyrical improvisation at the end of the first two choruses. It gets a sort of Arabic twill. And uh, it was, again, it was an unexpected discovery that Tilly brought to the performance, which we're grateful for. Amazing. And I suppose as well for me, you know, we, we've got to mention, I mean, Georgie Max bass. Oh, my word. Yeah. It's just incredible. It's, it, it, you know, as well as it, it's a real driving. I mean, the song is just a driving force. It's just it's just a force to be driven by, basically. You know, okay. Georgie Mac on there. Um, I mean, I suppose we should we should open up and, and, and speak about, the you know, the, the, the amazing session musicians that, that you've assembled, really, for the project, um, you know, as, as, as in quite a short space of time, Steve, really. Yes, I think you're right, Mike. I, it's been very, um, it's been a privilege and a real um, gift to have people like George McFarlane and Talisa York and Rue Saville, particularly, who's provided backing, singing on uh, Thank God for Rock and Roll and some others. We had Abby F. Jones, who provided backing, singing on um, Queen Kong. Uh, these are established singers in their own right. And, uh, for instance, Rue has been uh, doing, doing session work and touring with Florence and the Machine, uh, Rag and Bone Man. She's got on her credential belt Sting. She's worked with Nile Rodgers. She's quite, you know, a, a prolific artist in her own right. And so we were really blessed that she could come down to Epsom at Echo 7 Studios where George McFarlane was uh, recording us and um, and it was uh, George's insistence that uh, that Rude came down. Um, so George is a um, little bit about George McFarlane. Uh, George uh, has been a musician and poly musician and <coughs> been there pretty much all of his life. He uh, worked at some of the major studios in London, um, including Basing Street Studios that became uh, Farm West uh, and all of those with Trevor Horn and stuff. He then went over to the States. He's worked at Ladyland, I think. He definitely works at Paisley Park. He was one of the, the regular in-house sound designers there for Prince. And he's got some great stories of working oh, with yeah. Prince. And he's, worked, you know, he's produced and worked with Chaka Khan. Chaka Khan's released records that he's written for, oh, sorry, that he's written for her um, and staying. So, yes, we have been blessed with a profound realm of great musicians um who are who are really willing to to, to jump in and help and i absolutely agree and i think it's, it's you know it's been amazing to see that that kind of that dedication to you know you lose one drummer you find another drummer i mean yeah. that that happened very fast you know when we're talking about thank god i mean it's it was um 
well, at one point, I, you know, I, I was thinking that we'd have to cancel the session. Um, and then you, you very quickly kind of found a, a replacement, uh, again, with, with, with George, you found a, a replacement drummer. Yeah, the drummer on, on Queen Kong, our first single through Aurora Eclipse, was um, George Reckel. He was a friend of uh, Ben 34, Ben 34 is our guitarist, uh, through the Guitar Guitar uh, shop in Epsom. Uh, just a quick shout out to say thank you to Guitar Guitar for supplying sp strings and other bits and bobs of uh, consumer balls. And um, uh, so, yeah, George Rickel came and played drum first time around. Uh, but he's an astrophysicist and is very busy with commitments in that department. So, uh, George McFarlane. Uh, engineer and sound designer at Echo 7, recommended Simon Cohen, uh, a friend of his. Now, Simon Cohen used to play with a well-known top 10 uh, hit band called Roman Holiday. It goes back a couple of decades or so, but they were a, a quite a well-known and prolific hit hit machine band at one point, Roman I'm, Holiday. Well, I think so it's... Simon, Simon Cohen has provided the drums in recording sessions for Sky Quaker up till this record and maybe the next next release. Amazing. I mean, I think as well that like you know George really kind of went, you know producing that track mm. and sort of you know recommending that drama as well. Yeah. Uh, you know that the whole philosophy. He knew he was a hard hitter. He knew he'd be yeah. able to get the specifics, the snare sounds that, that we were looking for, and the qualities of that record. And I really think it's kind of um, a, a big shout out to George um, at Echo Seven uh, Studios. The, the mix. I was very very impressed with the mix. Um, you know, yeah. it's, it, it's a very it's a very well treated and very well considered um, product, and I think that that started by almost considering perhaps right. I know what drummer we need. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think George work, works from the feeling his, in his gut, and he said this needs the right kind of snare player. And he said, I know, guy Simon Kern, he's just got an amazing power hit. And he, when you look at the Roman Holiday videos from the seventies, you actually see this guy. Pounding a snare, <laughs> gorilla drum. <laughs> yeah, and it man, it's, his snare is loud. Is it, it break? It's, it's, oh yeah, I mean, I can. I bet it was loud in the studio, mate. I mean, you know, you. But it's um. I mean, and that's not to say. I mean, because I was at the I was at the, the session for for Queen Kong and and, and George Reca. I mean, he you know the, the, he's so busy. The guy he came down to the studio. He was. I think he did. We did what we recorded three takes, I believe, all the way through. You know, and really, when I I mean, I, I mixed and produced Queen Kong, and and really, it was it was kind of. I think I did one comp towards the end and the rest was, was pretty much, there was no drum yeah. mapping or so, you know, the, 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 you know, ab absolutely incredible drummer as well. Uh, uh, George yeah. Raquel, um, uh, that, that was, that, that was very impressive watching, watching that, um, mm. you know, boom, boom, boom. Thanks guys. I got to run, you know, and we've oh, got to, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, abs yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. <laughs> you know, um, Ben 34. So I'm hoping to get Ben, um, yeah. on in for an interview. Um, you know, how on earth did you meet? How on earth did you did did, did you end up meeting Mister Ferdy Ford? Right, good question. I'd just flown back from Lisbon and making some TV commercials for a solar panel firm, and I had all I was in between getting back from that, turning around and going to Pinewood Studios to do the voice of um, Lara Croft's dad in uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider game, which subsequently came out and I kept seeing this guy walking around the streets with long hair and a funny beard and a guitar protruding from a backpack and I so I sort of scoped him out and surveilled him and I've been looking for a cool guitarist who a looked good but a knew good anyway I caught and as I was coming back from Pinewood Studios I saw him again so I pulled over and I, it was near some shops or something also lots of people picking up kids from schools and stuff I said I you do sessions? Are well, you in a band as well? <laughs> he went, both? Why? <laughs> Just wondered, do you want to join the, my band? <laughs> uh, I think about it. Uh, I've got to go somewhere. Where? Round the corner. Why? I live there. Where do you live? I live round here. Oh. Jumping. Brilliant. And that was the start of that. I love it. I love it. But it, is that going to happen? I mean, didn't we drag him into a curry house at one point as well? Me, uh, and, you, we, me and you were having a curry and he sort of walked past and Ben is Ben. Yeah. And I, exactly. <laughs> he seems to get dragged into these situations, doesn't he? 
<laughs> well, Ben's always is always zipping backwards and forwards from lessons teaching people or sessions. Yeah. Uh, he's one of the he's one of the most sought after guitarists in in the area, and um, rightly so. And uh, and yes, you can hear why as well, especially in his his uh, his um, he does four different lead guitar solos on Thank God for Rock and Roll, and they're all completely different and unique and uh, ex executed with absolute aplomb and accuracy. Um, so, yeah, I, I just used to see him around and that, that was it. Incredible. Incredible. He's an incredible guy. Yeah. Man. He did. Yeah, he was, you and I were having a meeting and then he zipped by the curry house. We went, Oi! Bloody <laughs> fool! Fancy a pop and top! <laughs> Yeah, all right. That's it. The guys in the curry house thinking, "What? What's going on with these blokes?" You know, it's turned it into a, turned it into an Aurora meeting house. You know, um, yeah, that was quite amusing. But yeah, no, but I, I really hope to get Ben on. Um, you know, because I know he's going to have a lot in terms of. I mean, Ben is what I could would, would consider. You know, I think from a composer standpoint, and I don't know, maybe backtracking slightly, I don't know how you feel about this, Steve, but. I always have had, you know, when you've got a musician who really has honed and that that instrument's been like their, it's been their, you know, their their, their holy book. For for, I mean, I have had chats with, with with Ben about this before. I know he had a little bit of a gap in his guitar playing for a, for a few years, but it's it just took hold of him, I think. And 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 I've always been kind of quite envious of that amount of talent that a person can have and that much dedication to that. I think my brain's too all over the place, which is why I ended up being a, a you know a composer and a producer because. I didn't have that dedication, I suppose, to just sit and write. I'm playing the guitar for the rest of my life. You know, so musicians to me, I always, if ever I go to a concert, if I go to the proms or if I go and see a rock and roll act, if I, anything, I go and see any live music, you know, even a street busker, you know, like I'd, I'd, I'd love at one point, I'm going to say this, I'd love at one point when, when possible to almost create a band and do a song from street buskers. I don't know why I've always wanted to, it's always been in my brain. I'd love to just walk around London and and network with street buskers and do almost like a street buskers um, uh, collect, collective performance. Well, you I know. should point out uh, the, the wonderful Italian or Sicilian Giuliella, Gi, Giuliella, Giulia Marielli. Giul, Giulia Marielli. Uh, she's a fantastic, uh, well known street performer and a great songwriter as well. Brilliant jazz singer. You know, uh, you're going to have to. Um, you're going to have to message me that name because I, I will. Giulia Marielli, and there's also Buster Redlock. Redlocks. Buster Redlocks. He's a funk soul uh, guitarist. I, I actually had my eye on him for Skyquaker. Okay. But he was busy touring and busking on the streets. He's often around Central London or Kingston Thames. But right. uh, in fact, Buster might come in and do some reggae stuff for us. Incredible. Uh, where Ben will be will be doing some um, heavy metal stuff. And some of his really difficult Seven Eleven timings, which uh, Ben Thirty Four is renowned for. Yeah, um, yeah. he isn't renowned for it. And I remember, I mean, maybe this is one for Ben's chat, but I remember a conversation he recently had with me where he was asking my advice on whether to get Logic or Pro Tools. You know, the collective tends yeah. to use Pro Tools, and Ben's kind of—I have used Logic, but but you know, Ben's like, if I got Logic, could could we use it? In, in and I'm like, I'm thinking. I said to him, I know your time signatures, mate. Yeah. I said, make sure you get just get Pro Tools and do us all a favour. <laughs> I did the same last night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, "Get bloody protocols. You'll sort out your timing stuff." Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I love it. I love it. So, I suppose, um, really, what I, what I kind of wanted to, you know, to, to to kind of hone it down is in in terms of, you know, where are we looking to go with Skyquake? Obviously, we've got, we've got. Um, um, I'm happy, by the way, whatever you want to say, Stephen, this is it's no problem at all. You know, obviously, I know we've got. Um, thank God for rock and roll, which is due out for the twelfth. Um, and then we're going to push forward. I, I, I gather with a track called Five Claw, um, uh, which I don't think it matters if we give a, f a bit of information away about it, um, because it, it lines up the what what fans can get next, you know. Um, and and that's that that's a it's an amazing track. It's it's it, it's difficult because Skyquaker tracks kind of grow on me, you know, uh, like more and more over time. But I would say that the Five Claw has been one of my personal favourites. Um, of the of the repertoire so far uh, purely i think because of the i mean we've got an amazing uh, um producer um a, a dav singh who's contributed uh, to the, to, uh, to to five claw i don't re I, I want it to be a bit of a reveal i think with five claw so i don't i don't i don't think maybe we'll talk about what that is in terms of that fusion but it took me i mean i was at a train station i almost missed the train because i was just like what is the, what 
What is what is what is what is going on here? I had to phone you, didn't I? Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. So I mean, it, it, yes, hello. Can I have you your next train? We'll be arriving at platform seven, probably <laughs> seventeen thirty-six. If you run now, you might catch it. You might just about get it. Bars. Brilliant. Um, so thank God. I mean. That's our next kind of Skyquaker project. And then I suppose really it's going to be conversations of us moving forward, what we do from there. But I suppose your personal, it'd be nice to have you a little few, few some words from you, Steve, in terms of, your, I suppose, your ambition for Skyquaker. Where, where do you envision, I don't want to be that whole, like, where do you see yourself in five years question, which just irritates everybody. But I suppose that is kind of what I'm trying to ask. You know, do you, I know you've got a, an amazing um, uh, amount of stock and, 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 um, and records ready to go. Um, from the multi-genre influ- influences, and I'm hearing things all the time. So I suppose, yeah, just where where do you kind of see yourself and and Skyquaker kind of kind of going? I think that's a great question, actually, Michael. I, I try and address that the best I can. Um, Skyquaker is essentially at the moment uh, appealing to a rock audience, uh, metal, punk, power rock audience, um, and. Thank God for rock and roll is the the, the the second single from Aurora Eclipse that will that will carry that sound and that that enjoyment to that audience those audiences who like rock. Um, where we're going to go next is quite determined by different musical genres that we want to explore and bring in and offer out to other audiences that uh, we think we could entertain and we would like to reach out to. Um, and as a consequence, um, my friend Dav Singh, who is um, uh, 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 an Asian man, and he happens to be from Punjab, and he is a composer of various types of music, including Bhangra. So I've been looking forward to the, having the opportunity to work with Dav for many years, and this is, this is uh, five claws off of that opportunity up. I won't talk about the song too much because it's a surprise type song. Again, it's a story. Um, but uh, hopefully it will transport our listeners of the rock genre into another world that they've not yet fully thought they might appreciate and could, I hope, appreciate. Uh, furthermore, we, we were hoping to reach out to audi- audiences in the Asian continent and that part of the world. We want to, we want to make friends. There's a band called Bloodywood, uh, which is a heavy, heavy punk metal bangra band. Um, which I quite like, and they kind of got my attention. I wanted to sort of doff me a hat to them, like, you know. And uh, so we're going that way. We have some other approaches coming in. We want to be able to reach dance audiences um, with powerful music. Um, That is another challenge that we want to try and and meet. Um, the intention is to unify audiences who like different genres and perhaps they're there, never the twain do meet. Um, the, the intention overall is to, is to try and get our music to the world. Sure. I think that's, I think when, first off, I'll just say Dave as well. What a lovely, lovely guy. Um, I've really enjoyed the chats that I've had with Dave and I'm yet to meet him, but we've had lots of different chats um, uh, kind of behind the scenes and he's actually agreed to come on as well. So, you know, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be talking to Dave hopefully later in the week. Um, But I think it's, uh, I suppose, I suppose, you know, feeding into that, what you've just said in terms of Skyquaker, I think as well, it's bringing the cinematics in, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping as a, you know, as a label and as part of my job is to push you, Mm. push you back into the film and, get some stuff into trailers, get some of those textural sounds out there that which leaps mm. back to the band. Um, and I think that will help, um, you know, to, to build an audience from that capacity, get you into the game trailers, get you into those sorts mm. of things. So I think it's just, it's just interesting. I hope for, for, for our audiences to see a, a little bit of the, the crazy brain, this, the crazy things we talk about and the crazy things that we want to do. Um, but I, you know, I, I think it's, it definitely drives me. I know it drives the rest of the guys um, and especially Steve. So I think, you know, really what you, I think your, your goal there is, is, is incredible, mate. I think it's, we're halfway there in terms of the distribution. Um, mm. If anyone actually has got any, I suppose a call out to the, to the, to the, to the, to the greater communities, if anyone, you know, is um, is is Chinese, for instance, and and maybe and maybe living in the West or studying in the West, you know, and has kind of access to the social platforms. Maybe they could help us out in terms of sharing, because it's very difficult for us to get into those audiences in terms of social media platforms. Um, uh, the Weibo's of the world and 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 those sort and those sorts of things, the WeChats, um, because I think that 
you know, inevitably as Sky Quaker moves forward, there is going to be a hell of a lot of interesting content that's that's not just going to be appreciated by a Western audience. Um, and I think that, like, really, I think that's that, that's very much in our bio, isn't it? Moving forward for for yeah. for, for Sky Quaker. Yeah, very much so. Um, we want to reach out. And I think I think the lovely thing about what you've got going with Aurora Eclipse is uh, with Iceni uh, uh, and Les Obelisca and, and your other artists is there's, there's a, a very varied and unusual choice of sounds and styles there to be at. And again, storylines, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a it's a it, it's a mix of match. I think a few. I think you know the the, the message at the moment is is slightly unclear. But I think as we build content. Mm. Um, and really, the, these videos have been the start of that. It's you know, cut, yeah. welcome to our world. Well, welcome to our world, people. Um, welcome to the world. <laughs> it's right before you. Um, and now, you know, for the first cut, time in human history, we've all experienced the same lump of shit the world over. Aha! <laughs> Total <to>? unifying <laughs> syncopation of the world's suffering at once. Brilliant, and that's Steve without a couple of pints. But, uh, but, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but um, I can see why you stopped drinking coffee, sir. Yeah, but um, yeah, but um, half a cup this morning. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. They <laughs> brilliant. Um, but no, I think it's. I I'm really really pleased with with having everyone on board. I'm really pleased Correct. that the people seem to be on, on on board with it, and that I'm really pleased to see the conversations happening. I think that's that's really kind of been important to me is to almost see <laughs> people talking, people making music, people sharing ideas. Yeah. people collaborating um and just getting to meet such an amazing uh group of people um and a lot of a lot of that has come um through skyquaker so thank you very very much steve um uh, from me to you um on that um i'll do a more company based update um talking about the rest of the artists again i did do a bit of an, an intro video um last week but i just wanted to prioritize getting the guys through um and and, and going f- and going through the chat so i suppose really i mean where can people find uh, Skyquaker, Steve? Besides the uh, and yourself, for that matter, you know. Besides the obviously the obvious channels here at Aurora Eclipse. Where 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 can we find you? What's your your social media demon of choice? Uh, well, I suppose IMDb is going to have the more you know the, the the scorecard of what I've done as an actor um, and a little, a little bit of a biography there as well. Um, in terms of Skyquaker, it can be found at Aurora Eclipse Productions and. Uh, a few, I suppose, if I Google search Aurora Eclipse YouTube Skyquake, and I usually find something that is pertinent. But um, I gather Aurora Eclipse is releasing in on all of the best known um, digital uh, music platforms as well. It's yeah, you, you can find Skyquaker with us directly. You can find us on Bandcamp, uh, Apple Music. We're on Spotify, Deezer, Tidal. Um, you know, we're it, 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 YouTube. It's even on YouTube. Um, it's it's absolutely and you know, and then into the Asian markets as well. Uh, KK Box and and um, um, through all the different channels, um, the Ten Cent Network, um, obviously SoundCloud. Um, really, you name it, you you can find it. Um, so I suppose our ask from from us to you as a, as an audience is is you know d- just share it and engage with it you know go and have a chat to the guys um you'll find them all online obviously i'll be revealing more and more of the band as we move forward um but yeah there's a really there's a really special really special uh, movement arising uh, both within aurora and with skyquaker um and uh, it's it's been uh, it's been amazing um thank you very much steve for for kind of coming on and speaking Pleasure. to me thank today you, um, do, do you have any kind of any any final comments you'd like to make or any 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 burning things you'd like to say about yourself or anything about the band moving forward no i don't think so i don't think there's a lot to say other than uh we'd like to just reach out to audiences that haven't perhaps listened to things that they're not used to listening to. I think we're trying to open up people's curiosity. Appeal to curiosity. It's a very naive and, I suppose, vulnerable thing, really. Well, I think it's, I think it, I I think we touched on it. I think, I think it's, I think really there's, I think there's a, there's a calling for, for, you know, for, for more organic music, let's say, um, and kind of away from the mass, massively overproduced and the massively electronic, and getting mm. back into the studio and banging, making some damn noise. Um, and I think, I think really, you know, a lot of what um, AEP is doing is is embodying that really. Um, you know, so 
yeah, I think I, I think we just, it's just hit, it, but, you know as soon as we start building more than we already have, you know, and as you bring more and more people into the in, as we bring more and more people into the into the fold, I've, I really do think there's something quite special um, about to uh, about to, well, it's we're living it, mate. We're we're living and breathing it right now.